Good to be back, man. Hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Every time we uh, do one of these, uh, I don't know what the number is now. It's getting up there, but I'm always surprised by that theme music. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess I I, I usually don't warn you anymore. I'm like, oh yeah, no, we're pushing no, the I button. <laughs> I, I also I'm really curious if you guys uh, like if the the stream service captures what mm. the guest is doing during that little promo. Because I bet you it's just a collection of everybody you've had on the show getting a little groovy with it. Yeah. You know I mean? so that Sometimes might be I have to, thankfully the intro has like a little countdown of yeah. when the video is going to end. Because a lot of times I'll just kind of get lost in the, the beat. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready. I yeah, wasn't ready. exactly. Well, well uh, anyway. Mr. Adrian Bosman, welcome back, sir. Thank you for having me, Chase. It's always good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. And oh, we are we are almost a month out of the start of the 2024 CrossFit Games Open. And I did not like saying that out loud for my own personal fitness level. <laughs> I think my heart rate just elevated probably 10 to 15 beats just hearing that. Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at a giant calendar that I have behind my monitor here. And it, you know, it marches down the days. And even with that awareness, it still is like, oh my God, only a month. So, And here's the thing too, is like, I have an ignorance is bliss standpoint right now because yeah. I don't know what's rolling in on, on leap year day, which would be the, isn't it like the first day the release is that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So first open workout will drop on the last day of February, which this year uh -huh. happens to be a leap year on February 29th. So that's kind of fun. I always found that so odd of like yeah, of all the is. days to pick, not, not just like, Hey, just tack an extra day in December. It's like February 29th. That's the, that's, that's the well, shorty. It's already, you throw an extra day on there, right? Yeah, that's it. It's, it's already the shorty. So you just no, well, as, as much as nerves you have, like you at least know what's coming. So I don't know if that's better or worse. In my opinion, it's worse because you can just <laughs> kind of stew on it for way too long. That's, you know, people are always so funny at this time of the year because like, so many interactions I have people ask about, oh, can I get a little tip? Can I get yeah, a little yeah, something? A little... And I'm like, number one, no, no, you can't. <laughs> And number two, trust me, you don't want that because then you're just going to turn it over in your mind for a yeah. month. Don't bring that on yourself. Yeah. Just, I, just I have a, take I it have as a hard comes enough time out. sleeping as it is, yeah. let yeah, alone exactly. thinking about what's coming in February. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it is the best time of the year, Boz. We are hard charging to the 2024 Cross the Games Open and the start of the Cross the Game season. And we are here to talk some shop about the Open specifically, maybe touch some quarterfinals info. And at the end of this, we'll talk about uh, regional exemption as a, a topic of conversation and uh, when we can expect those announcements to come down the pipeline. But uh, hey, I appreciate your time. I know we got a lot of stuff going on in uh, both of us individually. And uh, I just want to lead off is that, man, we had a great first kickoff day of the open. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. It's been out there a few times, but the first 24 hours of the open was the most signups we have ever had. The, 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 yeah. uh, the stat is since 2018, but it beat 2018 by almost 10,000. I think. Yeah. It's day. It is awesome to see. I mean, that kind of enthusiasm right out the gate is really cool. Uh, yeah, you love to see it. So I hope that we can continue that momentum. Um, like you said, I, I agree with you. This is like my favorite time of the year when we start thinking about the community, you know, especially if we just look at the CrossFit games. Yeah. The final events are always amazing. They're these big epic things, but I don't know. I'm, I'm a man of the people. I love the big mass start where everybody yeah. puts their toe on the start line and says, Hey, all right, I'm in. And you know what? I might not see you at the finish line. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to see most of you in Fort Worth, but the fact mm -hmm. that you're willing to get ready, toe yeah. up and go for it is just so cool. And, uh, again, there, it's so special. You know, I think it's easy especially for us, we were talking a little ahead of time. Like we're kind of getting to be on the other end of things now. Like we're yeah. a couple I'm of old like, men here. Division should I try again? I'm not right. Really but <laughs> my, my point is that having uh, a few open seasons under our belt, I think it's mm -hmm. easy to take for granted how special of an event it is. You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, 
there, there's not too many things like it in the world where you have this huge worldwide buy-in and everybody's pulling in the same direction and showing up for this one event. Like that's just so cool um, and unique. So it's a, it's a great thing to be a part of, in my opinion. And what I like about this is that it's evolved so much since 2011 in a variety of yeah. right ways, like the open announcement starting in 2013, uh, what the leaderboard first looked like in 2011, what it's like now, all the different categories and divisions and and uh, filters and what the events have turned into over the years. And it was six, five, and now it's three and mm -hmm. the and new season structure we're an hour is this our third year of or fourth year of open quarters semis uh it would be this would be the fourth season we started fourth 21 was the first year that introduced quarters uh -huh. so 21 22 23 and now 24 and, and when i look at that is like i remember open for me is when i first started in 2011 i still had you know we said toe of the line to see at the finish line like i had legit cross the games aspirations in 2011 so the open was so intense back in the day and then i was like all right let's make sure we try to get to regionals in my my later years in the 17 18 time and then now with quarterfinals is that the evolution of the open has taken a lot of different shapes being the 14th year that we've had and from your perspective both you know in your position and just as a a fan and individual yourself competing in the open what has that evolution been like for you well there's a lot of different angles we can take there um I think you're absolutely right. You know, how could it not evolve over the time that we've done it? And to pick up on a theme that I, I laid down earlier, you know, it's easy to forget the roots a little bit. And what I mean by that specifically is when we introduced the competition in 2011, there were no other online competitions in <laughs> CrossFit period. Right. And there was a lot of pushback. People were like, well, you're crazy. This won't work in an online format. This is ridiculous. It's going to be a flop. Nobody's going to get involved. It's going to kill the community. You hear, you heard all the doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. uh, obviously, that hasn't been the case, mm -hmm. and it has been a huge uh, success. Uh, I think by any metric, and um, you know, really cool to see the positivity around it. So, starting there, it's like the fact that there were no online competitions, and now we just take for granted that there are online competitions happening all the time. Mm -hmm. There's, all, you know, if, if people are interested in that style of competition, there are many competitions out there that use qualifiers as an online stage. Uh, you know, there's different challenges that happen all the time with, you know, different entities and like, that's awesome. Um, but it didn't exist back in the day. So we've learned a lot <laughs> and that, you know, we can talk about the nuts and bolts from a five weeks, six weeks, as you point out in the first year when, uh, <laughs> yeah. when we had some technical problems, uh, to the five week format that was pretty prominent for a lot of years down to the three week format. Now that's a lot more affiliate friendly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we've, we've definitely refined things a lot. Uh, and some of the things this year, kind of continuing that theme, uh, we, we identified some low hanging fruit from last year, especially where we're like, look, okay, there's some things we can do that make this competition easier to run for the affiliates, okay. uh, easier to engage with for people that are not in affiliates, but it doesn't take anything away from the competition or change the nature of who's going to qualify. And so some of those things like, Hey, we've completely redesigned the scorecards to make okay. them way more accessible and user-friendly. Uh, the challenge that we had to the team was like, let's try to design it in a way that it's it's more, quote, at a glance. So if I'm somebody that wants to pour over the rule book and read through all the documentation, that's there. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not somebody who's, you know, got that, that kind of uh, bent to them, I should be able to look at this scorecard and very quickly pick up on exactly what I need to do. And more importantly, what exactly is going to be incorrect to do. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've taken a completely different approach to that, which I think is going to be great uh, and, and just kind of clarify how people play the game. Uh, you know, other things like equipment profile, we get concerns every year from affiliates and, and people that are garage gym CrossFitters and stuff like that. Hey, am I going to have the equipment to do this? And, you know, this year we're really, really making sure that, yes, this is something that with common equipment that's found at every affiliate around the world, you guys shouldn't have a problem doing this en masse. So that's a big one. Uh, and then last year, you know, we had a, a ton of feedback on the layouts of the competition floor. Some of it, hey, people were like, hey, I like being told exactly what to do. But let's be honest, there were a lot of people that like, look, this is a bit of a burden to have to set this up in a specific way 
And I feel that. I mean, look at the space behind me. This is my garage gym. You have a beautiful garage gym, by the way. I got to see that in person finally, and that was wonderful. Yeah, I have a lot of nice stuff in here, no question. But the space is not Right, it's nice. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And so that being said, um, we're like, okay, let's take a hard look at these layouts and how much do they actually offer us at the open stage. And the decision that we came to was, you know what? For the most part, we can scrap them. Let's just not have layouts oh, okay. that are required, yeah. except when safety is a concern. So for example, if you have a pull-up element or something like that in a workout where you're hanging from an, uh, uh, an apparatus and you have a piece of equipment set up, yeah, we're going to have a minimum distance that we want those equipment pieces set so that there's no fall risk. You know, because if you're trying to be ultra competitive and cut down your transition time, yeah, you're going to sneak that bar a little too close, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but outside of those kind of safety considerations, we've completely eliminated oh, floor wow. plan layouts at the open. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, no, no more having to uh, blow your budget on tape to mark tape? the, yeah. the open. <laughs> <laughs> Blow budget on tape and then spend the next two days of like peeling the little pieces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every yeah. time you. <laughs> So, you know, those are a couple of examples of some tangible things that, like I said, they're relatively low hanging fruit, um, Mm -hmm. but I think they're going to enhance the overall experience. Uh, And even if they're one of those things that for the average participant, they might not even notice, you know, they're just showing up at their affiliate and doing it. It might not have a huge um, impact on them, but the people that have to, to put the work in to facilitate it, the coaches, the affiliate owners, et cetera. Um, you know, hopefully it's going to smooth that out. So they just have to come in and execute on game day. I love that. I mean, for, in my, in my role, at least is being an affiliate rep is that I did get, uh, I would say the feedback I got, I want to say that the mass amount of feedback, but those that decided to give me feedback, it all really centered around those three things that you just mentioned. And is that, was uh, equipment availability or use being a challenge, whether it was the open or quarterfinals, um, the layouts being tough? Because like every affiliate is different and they're structured yeah. differently. It's, it, they're not all a pretty, you know, 40 by 50 <clears throat> box. Some of these like the we, the awful like Tetris piece setup, you know what I'm talking Like that little zigzag yeah. piece. Like, and it just well, I mean, it's- challenges. And it's really cool to hear that you guys heard that feedback and are responding to that feedback specifically for the affiliates. I love that. Yeah, for sure. And, and like I said, I mean, when we took a step back and, uh, you know, examined, okay, does this have any real tangible effect on the competition at this stage? We're like, you know what? No, it doesn't. And, you know, to kind of put that in the broader context, um, and this is one of those things where it's, Hey, this is the nuts and bolts of the job. And and maybe it's not that uh, compelling to people, but it's the truth is that over time, you know, when you're running competitions like these, uh, you know, people want to know what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And that's absolutely appropriate, right? What are the rules? Mm -hmm. With that process, you become more and more and more rule, excuse me, rule bound in a sense, because, you know, you're like, okay, what about this edge case? Okay, what about this consideration that we didn't think about, but did come up this season? And before you know it, you have a 25 page document on how to do the deadlift, right? Who says the, uh, the rule book only gets bigger? Was that you or, or Sherwood? Yes. Yeah. And, and so at a certain point you have to take a step back and say, all right, what can we start streamlining so that mm-hmm. this doesn't just become this exercise in checking boxes to the point where yes, maybe it's bulletproof from a, a standards point of view, but nobody wants to do it because it's so arduous. Mm -hmm. That's not a good situation to be in. Now, that being said, you know, I think we've managed a a great balance where we haven't given away any sort of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of, of the competition as far as, you know, what, what's expected and and the standards and that sort of thing. Um, but we have looked at what can we eliminate and still maintain the integrity of it. Do you feel like some of that is also in relation to what the na- next stage is going to be and maybe how many people qualify there. Cause I look at the, the floor plan necessity back in the day was really when we started qualifying people directly to the cross at games from the open or even yeah. the you know, regional days where it's like, Hey, listen, there are things in here that we need to structure because what's coming next is, is pretty serious and we need to have a bit more 
micro focus on what's happening. But now with 25%, <clears throat> say, moving on to quarterfinals versus the 10% that we had last year, is do you feel that helps alleviate some of those maybe hardline stressors we, we placed on things in the last couple of years? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you know, having a bit of a wider berth absolutely depressures a little bit of that. Um, and I'll tell you, I think it's also kind of more broadly that we're just moving away from what, what's appropriate at, at certain stages, period. So for a little context, if we reverse the time uh, back to the COVID era, you know, mm. and we were in a situation where like, OK, are we even going to have a final stage of the games at all? <laughs> right. And we said, OK, yeah, we're going to do it. All right. How are we going to do it? Well, first stage, we're going to do it decentralized and everybody's going to compete out of their own gym. Mm. OK, you've got a very high level competition that needs to be bulletproof. So right. in that scenario, we really have to make sure that everybody's playing on the same field with the same layout and the same gear, et cetera. And so, you know, we had some pretty um, rigorous logistics that were associated with that. That kind of carried over into the next season where we're like, OK, we still have a lot of people playing from home. And the semifinals for mm. half of the regions that year had to be conducted in that same format. And then that kind of extended into okay, well, about that. Yeah. Jeez. And so so then we started thinking, OK, well, maybe that's something that would be uh, better for any online competition where we've got people playing from home, does that make it a more standardized, uh, you know, uh, a competition? And, and the, the answer is, yeah, objectively it does, but what is the cost of that? And does it actually matter for all stages of, of competition or is it really just more appropriate at these more, uh, you know, high profile, um, smaller qualifying position competitions? And, yeah. and I think, you know, having experimented with that for a few seasons now, it's pretty clear that, yeah, at the Open, the floor plans aren't really the critical factor. So let's, let's revisit that. I like that. And it's just, I think it's great to see that because I mean, you get this question all the time where it's like, Hey, what lessons did you learn from the year before? As if like anything inherently went wrong. But what I like is that what are the things that you discovered through trial yeah. and error? I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, think about any, any affiliate owner can attest to this, especially if they do their own programming is like, I learned something every week of, Oh, maybe that wasn't the best combo. Maybe that setup really strained the class class itself with more than 15 people. And those things can only happen when you, like you said, is like you put yourself in that position, you run an, an, an event, whether it's online or in person, and then you discover new things that maybe you needed 300,000 people to run through to figure out. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, the other end of it is just that the cycle time to do the next one is right. a long way away. And so it's always kind of tricky when Fix we do get feedback. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and hey, like we're, we're going to continue to get that kind of feedback from people, um, whether they love things or hate things. And that's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love that we have such a vocal community that's willing to invest themselves enough to say, hey, I care about this thing. Like you guys got to know this was my experience. Great. Let's let's go. Uh, but you know, the hard part about that is it's it's tough for us to like take that feedback and say, yeah, yeah, this is a great idea, but you're not going to see it for another 12 months because that's right. the next opportunity yeah. to do it. <laughs> so that can be, you know, a little bit of a challenge just um, and, and, and it requires a little bit of faith from the fans, too. Right. That, sure. that we are yeah. going to try to do the right thing, which, you know, <clears throat> in, in that time frame, it does get tough. And if we're just you know, some people uh, feel like they're just throwing a note in a bottle into the ocean and hopefully Someone right, will right, read right. it one day, but I, like you guys do take that feedback. But like you said, there is only a certain time window when you when you can do that. Uh, relative to the open and things we've had in the past, I know you've had uh, discussions on this, at least on our podcast before, is that you guys have released like an equipment list or what could be. Is that something you guys are still planning on doing this year? Because I know last year we may have looked, uh, I would say we, as in me and people outside of the CrossFit space look at that and be like, it's got to be this because it's on the, <laughs> it's on the list. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, we're not going to do an equipment list this year. Uh, but I will say, and I think I already have made it pretty clear that like, we are very committed to using an equipment profile. That's, you know, it's pretty vanilla. I, I would describe it as like, there's not going to be anything, um, that you wouldn't expect stepping into, you know, the average affiliate anywhere on earth. So, uh, that's kind of the lens we're looking at. Um, and to be quite honest, you know, again, we look at kind of the, the history of that equipment list. 
that was really born out of the COVID era. We didn't do equipment lists up uh, until it was a factor in COVID 2020. Just keeps... <laughs> well, but it made sense because we no, had a lot of yeah. people that they were unable to go to their gyms. And I mean, hey, hats off to the, the gyms that were able to weather that <laughs> storm. That was tough. And you had a lot of gyms that loaned out equipment to their members so they could continue working out at home and things like that. And so knowing that we had a huge percentage of people that were going to be homebound with limited equipment, we wanted to make sure that they knew exactly what they, they needed to have to be able to participate. That was that was the genesis of that. We didn't offer it up until that point. It really wasn't a big factor. Um, and so now that we're kind of clear of that, what we found in the last season or two was that the equipment list actually, I think, generated more anxiety. Mm. than it did actually clarify because people could what if the whole thing indefinitely and it's like Guilty. look <laughs> you're thinking this through way too you're, you're overthinking it is, is also guilty end, on that too the day. Yeah. um listen you can just say so, my name we're, 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 i can tell <laughs> well I'll, I'll say chase i i have pretty good firsthand knowledge that you're not alone there are many people that that fell down that same um that same rabbit hole uh but look you know I, nobody's trying to pull a fast one here. We want people to participate. We want people to uh, feel like they can pull it off. And so, like I said, we're committed to an equipment list that's not going to you know, blow anybody out um, and still gets the job done. So again, you know, there's, there's got to be a little bit of good faith there that we are uh, taking that into mind. And that's like a really serious lens that we're looking at the programming through. Um, and yeah, for that reason, it's like, you know, we, we don't feel that the equipment list is really helping us at this point. It's totally fair. And <clears throat> like I said, it goes along the lines of, you know, structured floor plans where it was yeah. more of a, I think it eventually became a limiter versus a, uh, a guide uh, at times, which is, it's cool to yes, hear that yes. those changes are coming and I'm excited to see that. When we look at the open as it is now with the new 25% movement on the quarterfinals is what are the, some of the things that maybe, do you feel like it gave you some more freedom with what could happen in the open? for the programming itself without a tighter constringent qualifying in the quarterfinals, or does that really not change anything on your end? No, I mean, honestly, it didn't change much. Um, you know, just allowing more people to qualify to a second stage. I don't think it fundamentally changed the nature of the open mm -hmm. with this current season structure. So no, it wasn't like a, uh, a significant, uh, factor as far as putting the open down on paper and and getting that to a point where we're ready to move forward with it. Um, you know, I think the quarterfinal stage is definitely where that change is more top okay. of mind because sure. hey, if on you're going to invite, question, so keep rolling. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let me put it this way: if you're going to invite more people to the dance, mm -hmm. you better have some steps that they can follow. Okay, and so knowing that there's this balance at that stage particularly where look i'm in that bubble 25 percent athlete me adrian personally <laughs> it's likely that if i you know get my act together between now and and march that i could make that 25 percent cut i am not a semifinals athlete i'm not <laughs> a games athlete there's no chance there but i would love to be able to sign up and participate and do these quarterfinal events if I qualify and I just get this series of workouts that I can't even participate in, it's like, what's mm -hmm. the point? Why would you bother letting okay. people in? On the other hand, we do have a very limited number of qualifying spots that move on to semis, both in the yes. age groups and the individuals and teams. Um, and so for that reason, you have to make sure that you're addressing both ends of that. So on the one hand, hey, if you qualified, you should feel like you can play the game and maybe you know you're not going to win it, but you should at least be able to get some field time, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. On the other hand, there needs to be enough of a challenge there that, uh, you know, really does separate the best from the rest in mm -hmm. a legitimate way where you're like, wow, okay, these guys are the deserving athletes that have earned these semifinal spots and there's no question in anybody's mind. So that, yeah. that was the more challenging stage to make sure. sure that both ends of that were met. Well, and if you think about it, and that question stems a bit from last year is like last year's quarterfinals programming was spicy, right? And that sure. was with, and that was with 10%. And now you take 15% and you know, people are just going to look at those 
work out, you know, 225 clean jerk. Cool. <laughs> That's uh, a little bit yeah. above my pay grade, especially when you add another 15% to that collective. But when I, when I look at things now with the new season structure, and I'd love your opinion on this uh, uh, concept is that old open regionals, um, games, the open was so important to get right because you did have to balance those two things so perfectly with a huge swath of participation. I mean, you talk back to 2018, which was the last year, you've got 415,000 people participating Mm -hmm. in the Open. To qualify 30 in your regional where they combined, I mean, that is is tough to do. But on on the other hand is that I look at it now, it's like, look, Open is our chance to participate together. You sign up for it, you pay to play, and now we're all doing our, I like to call our fitness fun run together in the open. Quarterfinals, you qualify for. It is now a competition, and I look at quarterfinals these days is almost like the old school open of you do have this large group of people taking the, the, the test, but we also have to qualify a very limited number of people to the next stage. And that, that balance, uh, I think, is more challenging than people truly do understand. Yeah, but I mean, that's our job and that's our responsibility. So, you know, happy to take that on. I don't mean for you. Um, I just mean for people perceiving as like, oh, well, just program is like, no, it's like we can't. For sure. You go two ways, right? Oh, it's everybody can play and it's almost like no separation or waste of time for the ones you're qualifying. Or, yeah, we qualified the right people, but nobody else really got to compete as well. And that that balance between the two, I think, is a very unique situation for the programming that, um, some people may not truly understand the uh, the beauty it takes to balance that appropriately. Yeah, and and I hope we get it right, and and I hope that uh, you know the people that are, like I said, the fans that that are passionate about this. Um, you know, I I hope they have a great experience with it, and if they identify some things that we could be doing better, like hey, let's let's hear it, and I'm sure we will. Um, I like that, but on, you guarantee that. Yeah, happen. on on that note, though, uh, I do want to talk about kind of the, I don't know, the cultural, philosophical end of the uh, the quarterfinal stage. Um, you know, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that, yeah, the open is depressured it a little bit. That doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, any less of a challenge. Yeah, it doesn't devalue or, it. In my yeah, opinion. yeah. Uh, but I, the way I see the quarterfinals and have for the past couple season is it's almost like an extended open. So if we go back to this idea of a three week open. Um, you know, it's great for the affiliate owners. It's great for the average member that, you know, it, let's be honest after week three, the fire can die down a little bit and weeks four and five can be a bit of a grind for people to commit to for the average person, not, mm-hmm. not the hardcore set. So, okay, great. We, we trim things down a little bit, make it easier to run, make sure that people can cross the finish line for that hardcore set that want to continue to compete quarterfinals is kind of that extended open it's not too far past the open you're kind of still in that same mode um you know still that kind of online affiliate style competition so you can get that kind of feeling now with more people involved in that our hope is that okay the open that's for everybody everybody's gonna sign up get to the start line let's go Mm -hmm. the quarterfinals yes you have to qualify into it and so we want as many of those qualifiers signed up and and playing But what we also want is the affiliates that have some of those qualifiers support in the way that, hey, you can set up these workouts and run them in your affiliate and they can make perfect class, uh, you know, workouts that you would run every day. Of course, you're probably going to have to scale them. Of course, that, uh, (laughs) you know, you're going to have to put your coaching hat on and do your job in that regard. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they're they should be manageable great workouts for that setting. And that's how you can support those qualifiers within your, your affiliate is, Hey, maybe we're not all signed up for this competition, but maybe it's Friday and we're just going to throw that workout in the normal class session as a show of support to those qualifiers that we do have. So kind of a fun way to, um, to keep that open spirit going mm-hmm. for those that want to participate in that way. So I would encourage people to, uh, to do that. Uh, and, and keep that, keep that alive. If that's something that you're interested in, uh, cause you know, that is a, there is a mixed bag of opinions around that. There's some people that absolutely love and want to die on that Hill that the five week <laughs> open is the only valid open and I will never change my mind. Okay, cool. Extend that party to quarterfinals and, and keep playing that way. Yeah. It's like you get a, you get a little halftime between open right. and quarters and you still get the amount of time that you wanted in the, in the first place. Yeah. 
What, and what I liked about, or I do like about quarterfinals is that when uh, I had my affiliate is that for those that qualified, it was very special for them personally. And mm -hmm. it was a smaller group of people because of the 10%. But the way we set it up, it was I don't know, it just like, it's like, all right, we got two people going, two people judging, eight people watching because we're all doing it together. Like I really enjoyed that. But at the same time, it's like sometimes I couldn't program all of those things, say for the group class, just based off setup and equipment availability. But now when your time is like, okay, now we have, they're going to have more time, which if, if people don't remember the quarterfinals, the individuals and teams will get more time to do these, yep. do these workouts, which allows affiliate owners to plug and play where they, they put these things with the affiliate. Like my favorite thing to do in the open is like Friday's workout is the open workout that got announced yep. the night before. I, I, it was always a thing with quarterfinals. It was like, okay, well, if these two are due at this certain time, we can put one on Thursday and one on Friday, and then it fits that. And we can do, we can space these things out. And I think it's neat is we can still incorporate the affiliate members who maybe didn't qualify, but still want to do it with those that did. And there's exactly. a larger group of camaraderie with the affiliate. Yeah, that's exactly exactly it so i hope people take that to heart and do it and you know we're going to do our best to support that as well we're going to have class plans available for those quarterfinal workouts um you know so that should give some uh some ideas as to how to incorporate them as well uh and like i said you know for the best that are vying for those top spots there's going to be plenty of meat on the bone um, <laughs> I, I can sum up some of the uh and this will be no surprise you know what i mean this is definitely not a spoiler alert there, there's going to be some uh workouts within that set where, hey, everybody starts, but maybe not everybody finishes. Ah, uh -huh. so, I like those. Yeah. It's like those, uh, what are those, like truck pulls at the monster truck rally where they just pull and dig into the dirt deeper and then, you know, the, the stronger one gets a little bit further. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, exactly. I mean, the transmission just, I just break the transmission at the start, but it's, yeah. uh, I like that. And I, I talked about this with uh, Conway the other day, based off something you had said in previous uh, a previous open, was it's okay to have things in there that the majority of people can't do. It's For okay. Sure. And that's CrossFit. That's CrossFit at its most basics roots. Like, I mean, we have this phrase, like, we can do hard things. Right? And if things are too hard for us to do, we need to learn how to do those eventually. Right? What can you learn from the lessons you took from the open or quarterfinals that you now can take to the next 360 days of training day in and day out in your affiliate? It's like, oh, I couldn't do a muscle up. Great. How do we get there? I don't know. Let's spend the year doing it. Let's work yeah. on pulling strength, dip strength, stability, and all of those things you do externally to maybe get that fabled muscle up one day is going to improve so many other uh, areas of your fitness that it's, it's, uh, it's actually a wonderful thing to learn during the open, things that you can't do. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's, um, you know, the mindset around what are your metrics of success? Mm. That's what it kind of comes down to. If your metric for success is that I could do everything that was put out in front of me. And the question is just how fast could I do it? Yeah. Maybe you're not looking at it as holistically as you could. Um, you know, I think, for example, you have a, a higher skill movement in there. Let's call it a backflip. And you get confronted with the fact that you couldn't do a backflip, but maybe you made an attempt where never you had made that attempt before. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a success, right? Because you're stepping on that path. It's right. hard to accept that as a success because you didn't do it. And you could point to that and just say pessimistically, well, I didn't achieve what was required. Fine. But did you get a little bit better than you were before objectively? Do you now have more direction as far as what you could be working on to improve that skill set? Yes. Is that going to result in a better outcome later on down the road? Yes. In my book, that's a big win, even if it's a little harder to swallow that pill initially. And so I think that's yeah. a long-winded way of, of agreeing with you that, yeah, that's a valuable <laughs> thing to learn, uh, both in the gym and in life. It's yeah. not always yeah. going to be just like, oh, yeah, I, I got it done. And now how, how can I get it done faster? It's like, no, no, sometimes you get stopped and you have to figure right. out why. Yeah. And, and then on the back end of that, and <clears throat> not everybody's personality is like this. And I don't know if I'm just weird, but the gratification to eventually accomplish that thing, regardless of the time it takes to do it, is so much more than just yeah. walking in and essentially checking a box. 
And I think more people need to get comfortable with that idea and mindset because at the end of the day, we are still doing a competition. The Open is a competition, well, quarterfinals is a competition, and it's okay to be challenged in ways that help you grow versus just walking in and walking through it unscathed. Yeah, and you know, without getting too kind of hippy dippy about it, <laughs> um, I you know I like to think about these concepts outside of the gym. Just think about your own life, and mm -hmm. let's let's even consider it in the sense of like a project around the house. You know, if you have friends that own a home or, you know, have a little piece of property or whatever, and they've gone through the trouble of building out, you know, even if it's just like a little planter box in the backyard and they're, they've grown vegetables for a season, you know, they're going to be proud of that because it took some time. Yeah. It took some effort. It took some stumbling. They probably didn't know what they were doing at first. And then like the result was really cool, but it was a long-term thing. Mm -hmm. versus oh, I just paid some contractor to slap it together and I have a gardener. There's probably <laughs> not as much pride in yeah. the, even just a simple thing like that. You know what I mean? Even if the outcome might be the same. Um, so that analogy might be a little clunky. Fine. No, I, 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 I feel the same way. Out. Like uh, I, one time I changed a brake light on my car. There you go. Yeah. And I felt like the, the greatest man that had ever walked <laughs> the earth. And yet I'm just <laughs> dealing with modern technology and a light bulb. <laughs> versus taking it to a mechanic and getting it done in, you know, three hours for a couple hundred bucks. I was like, oh no, right. this is actually, I feel like I love my brake light now. This is my brake yeah. light. <laughs> well, there you go. So, you know, I don't think we need to, uh, to uh, beat that one to death too much, but the idea is that, yeah, man, taking the time to work something through and really earn it. I mean, yeah, that's a huge point of satisfaction in, in life generally. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to throw you a curveball, Boz. Is uh, speaking oh, like of beating things to death, um, are we going tests or events this year? <laughs> that's uh, that's a great question. I love it. Uh, I and I love how pedantic people get over that sort of thing. Uh, it, it does kind of crack me up. Like I get it. You know, words matter and all that. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so we're everybody just calls them workouts colloquially, colloquially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the online stages in particular. Um, open and quarters, we're just going to call them workouts. And once okay. we get to the more um, high level competitions, uh, we're going to prioritize event. Ah. I, think that rolls, I think that rolls off the tongue a little bit more. But again, at the end of the day, I, it's funny to me how fixated people get on that sort of thing. Um, because yeah. I, I hey, don't think like, it really, really I'll, I'll, changes I'll much. I'll throw my hands up and yeah. be like, hey, Mercy Street. <laughs> I'm one of yeah. those guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that, you know, from my own personal uh, angle, is that I do think it is important, especially as we start getting into these um, more kind of higher level competitions where the specific aim is sorting people by their fitness or advancing them to another high level competition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not training. That's, that's different. The outcomes are, are explicitly different. When I am training, my goal is how does this facilitate better fitness in the future? Mm. And when I am at a at a competition like the semifinals or the games, the explicit purpose is what can people do right now today? And there's no thought given to does this actually develop them for future fitness? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. and like surely participating in that does to some degree, right? I mean, obviously there's a lot of overlap between your average workout and something that is going to test that fitness. But at the end of the day, the purpose is different. When I'm showing up in the gym every day, the purpose explicitly most of the time is how is this going to continue to develop me? Whereas when I show up at a competition, explicitly the purpose is who can display the best fitness today. So they're fundamentally a little bit different, even though there's a ton of overlap between the two. Right. So anyway, for what it's worth, I think you know that distinction kind of comes out in that terminology, but it, it's one of those things that I don't think people need to get too hung up on. In my opinion. Yeah, well, certainly not anymore because I can say event <laughs> record. <happily. laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, if if anybody wants to program in their affiliate or for their friends or for themselves or for an event to rewind what you just said for the last two minutes, I think is absolute gold when just from a programming perspective because there are well, let's just say workouts that are great training days to, like you said, advance your fitness. Things like. I mean, people would 
discredits like how valuable doing a Turkish getup would be when it comes to little areas of fitness or strength development or core stability and shoulder stability and things like of that nature. Maybe it doesn't present itself well as like something for time at an event, right? Just by the nature of the movement per se. And it doesn't mean it can't, but like those training workouts versus say a testing workout. I think there's a huge, um, not a huge separation, but understanding the value of the two and, and difference at times, I think is uh, often overlooked or misunderstood. Yeah, and, and uh, again, I think that that is something that every coach is going to have to play with that in their own way and figure out how that fits. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of shared knowledge between people nowadays, but uh, yeah, you're going to have to sort that out. And I think that even if people don't articulate it, it's pretty obvious to most people that are coaching in any capacity for any length of time that you're not going to PR in the gym every single day, nor are you going to put in a PR effort every single day in the gym. It's just not sustainable. <laughs> Sometimes nor is it, walking into the gym is my PR for the day. Yeah. And, yeah. and nor is it necessary to continue to make progress. Now that doesn't mean that you can just show up and like slack off every day. That's probably not going to have best outcome either, but to suggest that you got to be every single day, 100% effort, every single day is, you know, a PR or close to it. It's like, okay, let's, let's see how long that lasts. I'll talk to you in a year. Tell me how that went. Um, But when it's come, when, when it comes to game day, well, Hey, you better be ready to unload. Mm -hmm. That's the day that the tank gets emptied and you really see like, what can you do? So it's my favorite part. My favorite part of training and competing is like training day. I was like, listen, I'm just going to take something out of it. Maybe it's not my best effort, but I'm going to take something from this. And yeah. then competition day, I was like, okay, it's, <laughs> it's do or die time when it, when it comes to that. So I, yeah. I really like that. But um, all right, so we uh, recapped a little bit of this. Is like, okay, uh, say open quarterfinals, 25% now going to quarterfinals. Floor plans, loosening up, scorecards, yep. more accessible, uh, easier to read and understand for the affiliate owner or even just the everyday athlete. Yep. Looking at, uh, we're going to, not add an equipment list to, to bothers people's uh, mental state for the next <laughs> four days. Well, and, and honestly, hopefully because it's just not needed. It's just like, yeah, it's going to be normal stuff. Don't sweat. Yeah. It. You, it'll be all right. Yeah. You can, you don't have to install those pegboards just yet. That's guys. right. Yeah. <laughs> not this season. And then, uh, I, I want to shift gears a bit, uh, unless you have anything else on, on open and quarters and, when we look at semifinals and where people compete based off their either where they're living or where their citizenship is, is that uh, the big thing is regional is regional exemptions. Those uh, when were those actually due? I, I forgot. So that window we're recording today, uh, we're still a couple of days left in January. I'm not sure when this is going to go to air, but we have a deadline for regional exemption submissions on February 1st. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure so that. Going. February. That gives our team a couple of weeks before the open to review any cases that are submitted and make the determinations so that prior to the open, everybody is sorted into their appropriate region. And then there's no changes once the season begins. So we, we started that process last season and that was the first year that we've offered that. Uh, and so this is the second season we've already worked through, I would say about two dozen submissions. Um, wow. I, I would I was thinking a couple hundred. Honestly. No, it's, it, you know, it's funny because when we started this process last year, we were prepared for like, okay, we're probably going to get like a lot of these. And yeah. the number was relatively low, uh, okay. generally speaking. It was not nearly as many as I thought it might be. Uh, so anyway, that, that theme is kind of extended this year. We've, we've gotten, um, you know, about the same number that we received last year, uh, in addition to the ones that we re-granted. Um, okay. And so... We are working through those cases. Uh, in some instances, we've already made some determinations and those athletes have been contacted individually. Okay. Once we have the entire batch completed, uh, we will publish that list to the game site and it'll be available just like it was last year. So people, if they're interested, they can go and see, okay, who was where and where are they now? And I think the, the one difference there is that last year it was, it seemed like it was like a running list, like a constantly updating list. And you guys are saying, once you've made all the decisions, that final list will be published with no additions to it potentially. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I 
honestly, I don't remember how we published last season. I don't know that it was running. <clears throat> and if it was running, it was only running up until the open because once I, the open, same yeah, I, I, yeah, not past the open. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so once we have the entire batch of athletes that have submitted and been determined, we'll, we'll release them all publicly at the same time. Now, for those that didn't or are or new to it or didn't hear it or listen to it, what the regional exemption actually is in place for and how you guys, without getting into the weeds too much, is, is apply these certain decisions based off the athlete's situation. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there, with any rule set that you put in place, there's always going to be edge cases and there's always going to be people that, you know, the rule doesn't necessarily fit. Uh, that's just true for anybody that's like, you know, designs games, designs competitions. There's always going to be some edge cases. Uh, and with any rule set, there's always going to be, well, let me go back and say, there's no utopia, right? Like there's no perfect set that just no. everybody and sorts them all nicely. <laughs> there's always a trade-off, right? Okay. And so when we move to the uh, citizenship uh, sorting mechanism, you know, the trade-off there is that sometimes you have people that are citizens of a certain country, but they haven't lived there in 20 years. Mm. So is that really reasonable that they get sorted back in that same place? Right. But if we look at the other end and we have something similar to what we, I guess it's not even fair to say we had it. We just weren't developed enough in the early regionals days to really even uh, have rules around this. But you had the hired gun effect where people mm. were like, okay, you know what? I'm an athlete in Europe. And the way that the divisional, the geographical division is, is laid out, if I just get a coaching gig in Dubai mm -hmm. and I head out there to a region that's less populated and less competitive, I could probably qualify. And so you'd have people with, you know, those kind of opportunities yeah. basically shopping around for a region that would allow them an easier path to the games without having to have a significant stake in that that actual place and right. we thought okay well maybe that's not what we want to support either so anyway that's a lot to say where we are now is you know citizenship is going to be the primary sorting mechanism but there's obviously people where hey they've been long-term residents of other places and it doesn't really make sense to sort them into their original country of citizenship so one of the ways, and this is the primary way that people can apply for an exemption is if they've been residents of a country outside of their country of citizenship for more than three years. So it's, okay. a, pretty, it's a pretty black and white yeah. rule. Uh, if you've been living somewhere um, since February 1st of 2021, so that's three calendar years uh, from the exemption date, then you would be eligible for changing regions. That's one of the criteria. You know, okay. other criteria we have in the rule book, um, just so that we have some more latitude if there's special cases, you know, if people have uh, other restrictions, maybe that's a visa restriction or some sort of, I don't know, geop geopolitical reason that restricts yeah. you from moving uh, abroad, that, that could be another reason somebody could petition and we'd review that. Um, you know, another obvious one is that they could not travel back to their country uh, where the semifinal is going to be hosted. Right. Um, you know, again, so we'll, we'll consider those factors, but the primary reason that most people submit is because they've been living somewhere for long enough that does not match their country of citizenship. And another part to that. So people, I think get a, a little bit more transparency is that you guys don't just have like a bullet list and it's, you know, check, check, check. It's like, you guys have a, a group of people that focus entirely on making these decisions. Yeah, we, yeah, absolutely. We have a team that reviews it. The team has to be uh, decided before we move forward. There's a lot of conversation that goes into it, but I will be honest that most of the cases are pretty cut and dry because yeah. most of the cases have to do with length of residency. And most of the time, that's the most black and white rule that we have. Hey, were you here before that February 1st uh, date or not? And in those instances, there's not a lot to discuss. It's it's pretty obvious if somebody's been there or not most of the time. Got it. Got it. And then that list will get published before this, or at least finalized before the start of the open. With That's the deadline, correct. Yeah. With the deadline of submission being February 1st. Yes. So if you're an athlete out there that thinks this applies to you, <clears throat> at least while we're recording this, you got a couple more days to submit your application for exemption. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, but yeah, February 1st is the deadline to get those uh, requests in. Like I said, that gives our team a, a couple of weeks to go through 
and make sure we have all the information we need to make a decision and then make those decisions before the open. Love it. Love it. Well, Boz, listen, as we, we wrap things here, a couple of things I want to ask you about. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some, uh, some one word questions. Okay. Uh, maybe based on feelings. Uh, but things that, uh, internally that I'm excited about is the, the, uh, the march towards the open, the, uh, the worldwide excitement when it comes to, I know we've had these calls <laughs> specifically is like in the in-house intramural intramural that happens with affiliate owners and that setup that could be happening. I, I, I think, I, I don't know if we'll all be on the same team this year, but who, if we are, I think we owe our captain an apology of, of what we may be bringing to the table, but the, the excitement that comes no, around come that <laughs> when it, I mean, uh, trash talking I'm doing myself with other affiliate reps in the area, especially with the international well, team. I would say the trash talk is probably 80% of it. So that's, that's a good start. <laughs> it is. It's like, it's, it's, I can talk much better than I can walk these days. So I'm just going to lean into that as hard as I can. But um, I'll give you, since you are uh, uh, the man behind the curtain, you, you are the, the great wizard. One, when we're one of, one of. One of the, uh, you, you and the collective group of wizards is the... The tribunal <laughs> is, uh, think, I would say this, one word for you to describe your feeling on what's coming up in the open. Excitement. Okay. I mean, that's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to shift to quarterfinals. Okay. What we've got coming in quarterfinals or how you see that projecting out. You have excitement for the open. And knowing what may be coming for yourself in quarterfinals, what's that one? Oh, man. I mean, I, I hate to say it. <laughs> excitement is definitely the, the first one that comes to, to mind again. Um, but, oh, gosh, I'm failing this miserably. Uh, <laughs> I would say... I could give you more than one if that would help. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I'm a rambler, so like the one word is hard for me. Um, Ramble on, Led Zeppelin. What? <laughs> uh, quarterfinal is going to be fun. Mm. I, I love. Fun. Okay, so it's, you know what? That okay. was right because that was but, the perfect word with the perfect tone. Yes, and and that's exactly what I was trying to convey. It's, it's <laughs> and I'll expand on that one word. It's going to be fun in the sense that guys like me will be able to do it, sort of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it's going to be fun to see what the best can do with some of these things, too. Mm, I so like that. So fun, fun in the sense that, hey, man, a bigger group of people are going to get to experience that, but also fun in the sense that it's like, that'll be the stage where you really get to see, like, wow, okay, there are levels to this. There are, <laughs> there are people that are playing, and there are people <laughs> that are competing. <laughs> I love that because I, I hear excitement. And I think it's about as exciting as a roller coaster that you may or may not be afraid to be on. I see that, right? That big drop. Nobody really likes the loop-de-loops. Just depends. I hear fun is the way I would describe a fun workout in the gym to the, my, the people I'm coaching. And we know as like any positive adjective you spin on what it could be is always in quotation marks <laughs> and up to the interpretation of the person taking, uh, <laughs> doing the workout itself. But, uh, Boz, listen, I appreciate your time. Ooh, uh, hold on. I, I got a couple about... more. Oh, I got please. a couple more plugs Sorry. before you let me go. <laughs> let me, let me take over and do your job yes. for a second for, uh, as the host. <laughs> uh, yeah. A couple of things that I just wanted to bring attention to that people might not be aware of. And I know this is late in the game on the, at the end of the podcast here. So if you're still listening, awesome. Good on you. Um, but some cool things that I think, uh, are either new this year or just, you know, kind of get overlooked. Number one, you mentioned it, but those custom leaderboards on the oh, open, man, yeah. they are so fun. Yeah. And people, I don't think understand how cool those can be. Like you can literally create a leaderboard for a big group of people and try to get like a worldwide thing. And a lot of those already exist, like garage CrossFitter, you know, stuff like that. Get on those leaderboards. They're cool to see, you know, your state, your town, your country. Um, it's really cool. Uh, you can also create them that are so customized that maybe it's just you and three other people. Fun fact, like almost every year I set up just a Roboz one just to see. Oh, no Even way. though we don't do it officially <laughs> anymore, you know what I mean? So yeah. like you can do fun stuff like that. And so play around with that custom leaderboard um, feature. It is really cool. And, Our you know, we try to. Six foot or over 
was a leader. Yeah, I think there you go. actually started that leaderboard. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's fun to slice and dice things that way. And the open's a great time for that because there's so many other people. And so the pool is big enough that you can probably find some people that, you know, have that similar interest or, or you know, attribute or whatever. So do that. And second, this year, um, no secret, you know, uh, it's something that people have really wanted for for a long time is like an open t-shirt you know yeah I, mean? um, I got I so, heard mine. yeah so there yeah. you go so it's kind of fun to have that available for the people that that's a uh, important to um you know and if you register and get those early you'll have them in time for the open if you wait until the last minute they might not get to you in time so if that's important to you <laughs> do that now and uh and get your t-shirt because it is and cool I, to uh, to have that i'll add on that it's like if you're an affiliate owner you get a little bit of a discount so yeah, there you go, you know, get a couple. No, I shouldn't say that. Whatever. Just get, yeah, get them. <laughs> get them. <laughs> yeah. I get love that. If, I love if, that. That's, yeah. if that matters to you, if you're a t-shirt person, Hey, it's there for you. If not, Hey, you don't have to hang fine. up on yeah. the wall. I gosh, yep. I, I remember I used to do that in uh, the, the off the coach's office at cross at Dallas central yep. was just, we would get drop-ins and they would bring in t-shirts like the old school barter says like, Hey, here's a t-shirt for my gym or here's a t-shirt for my country or, and we just pin those on the wall. I kind of want to do that again in this room. Cause it would really help with you the should. podcast acoustics. Yeah, absolutely. I, my uh, previous garage, I did the same thing. I would take uh, just cardboard <clears throat> and cut out 12 by 12 squares and then fold the t-shirts oh, over yeah. them and just yeah. stick them to the wall. And you get this nice, neat, uh, tiled effect there displays you go. well. It's easy to set up and you can just keep adding to it. So yeah. Genius. I love it. Well, boss officially, thank you again for your time. Uh, I'm, I'm always excited about the open this year just feels a little different in uh, the most positive way. I'm excited to see. I didn't really get to fully do it last year. I, uh, I just got cleared from uh, shoulder surgery. I had a year later uh, last year's like three weeks before the open. And I, I, I was fun because I actually did all the adaptive upper body events that year. Oh, that's so cool. That was, yeah. that was humbling. Uh, I found out how fit Casey Acre was. Uh, and about 1,000 other guys was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. They are so fit. So that was really cool. And uh, I'm excited to uh, tackle it full on this year for the first time. And uh, I really, I guess it'd be two years. So. I'm super pumped, but uh, boss, thank you. I'm excited to see what rolls out later down the uh, road come February 29th. If you guys haven't registered for the Open, why are you listening to this podcast and not in it? You are a fan, so be a part of the community. Put your toe on the line, as boss says. Be a part of the Open, and uh, I'll just do a plug for the South Central athletes. Is uh, We've got some work to do to show up these other reps, and international. Go America. Uh, boss can say that too now. <laughs> That's true. Official. Yeah. You're yeah. official. Yeah. Pick a side, Boz. I, just, <laughs> I did. I mean, I'm here. So Yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. You did. You did uh, it in probably the most substantial way you possibly could. Yeah, there you go. Oh, well, anyway, hey, Boz. Well, yeah. I'm, I was just gonna say thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. I love talking about the open and um I can't wait to to get it going. And um, you know, I'll see everybody on the leaderboard. It'll be fun. That's right. And if you guys have any problems, just you know, it's remember it's Boz's fault. So <laughs> All right, guys, have a great day. We'll see you guys in February.